Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Agile Delivery in a Continuously Regulated Environment. We welcome all VIVID members to this VIVID and HPE Post-Discover Summit 2017, which is brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. My name is Andreas Birk. I'm your host today. I'm founder and principal consultant of software process management and Vivid TQA SIG leader. TQA is the Vivid Special Interest Group on Testing, Quality, and Application, uh, application Lifecycle Management. From my, from my project, Okay, Andreas, we've lost your audio, so um, I'll go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Today's speaker is Brendan Woods. He is the uh, Group Head of Systems Delivery with the AMAC Group. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience uh, successfully delivering IT solutions to large corporations. And Brendan currently leads a large team of architects, software engineers, system implementers, and test analysts in the delivery of innovative solutions for the Allmat Group and its customers. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Today's session is a live session intended for all Vivid members. The recording will be posted in the webinar section on the Vivid website and will be visible for all members to watch on demand. Additionally, today's slide deck and the webinar recording will be made available to you as well. We will send you the link via email once they are posted to the Vivid website. To enlarge the presentation pane on your screen, just click on the rectangle in the upper right-hand corner of the presentation pane being pointed to by the red arrow. If you have questions as we go along, please type and send them in using the question and answer pane on the left side of your screen. Simply type in your question and then click on the ask button. To ask a question and receive them in your native language, click on the flag in the upper left hand corner of your screen, which is shown here on the picture, and this will launch a language selector box. Next, you'll click on the radio button next to the language and then click okay. on and apply and you're all set to go. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and I'll hand it over to Brendan Woods. Thank you and uh, good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on I suppose what part of the uh, world you're in right now. So yes, my name is Brendan Woods as the speaker said and I head up IT systems delivery for a for a pharmaceutical company called Anmac Group. And over the next 40 minutes, I'd like to tell everyone what it's like to deliver software in life sciences, a heavily regulated environment, and how we're trying to become more and more agile with regard to our delivery. So I really want to tell everyone what we've done to date. We've selected a case study, um, a very big case study of our product that's just gone live and how we've used a tool called Agile Manager from Euler Packard Enterprise to help us with the long range planning and delivery of the project. And I suppose more importantly, and, and to start the ball rolling in a few minutes, why it's important for our industry to do this, and I suppose when I look at the list of attendees, why it's important for any industry to, to think about being more agile and going faster in your IT delivery. So very briefly, a little bit on Almac, I think it's important just to put a little bit of background behind who we are. We're, I described ourselves as a, a pharmaceutical company, but primarily we're, we would be a, a contract manufacturing research organization in the pharmaceutical industry. And that means that we would offer a, a range of services to other biotech and pharmaceutical companies to help, to help them develop and bring their drugs to market. That would be from drug discovery, through clinical trials, testing in the lab, and then manufacturing and packaging and labeling distribution of commercial drug. Would be a highly reputable brand within the, within the pharmaceutical industry. And I would say that there isn't a disease known to mankind 
where we haven't had another biotech or pharmaceutical company bring a cure or a drug to market. We have our own products, and we also do a lot of R&D work in oncology, and we have two, I believe, two drug candidates now for ovarian cancer, and we also do a lot in the field of precision medicine. So I did say at the very start it was the why that really matters, why we need to go faster, why we need to improve our capabilities. The little boy in the picture here is Daniel, and Daniel is my oldest son. He's holding his little sister, Laurie, here. And Daniel was born in May 1996, and for about two and a half years of his life, he lived a very normal life of a child of that age, and I think the term terrible twos come to mind when I think about how Daniel was back then. And anybody who has children or nieces or nephews would know the term terrible twos. But a short time after that photograph was taken, things changed, and Daniel started to develop tummy pains. He'd wake up in the middle of the night in excruciating pain. He would be sweating a lot. During the day, he became quite lethargic. And his mum and I, over the next several weeks, would go back and forth to the ER, to the hospital, to see consultants and various tests and scans done. And eventually, Daniel was diagnosed with a childhood cancer called neuroblastoma. And neuroblastoma is a, an aggressive form of childhood cancer. It's cancer of the central nervous system. And for Daniel, it manifested itself as a solid tumor in his tummy. And as you can imagine, for any parent, it is your worst nightmare. And you know, I read an article recently about the advancements that the industry that I work in is making in a range of different areas. And the article I read just before Christmas talked about the last six years, 77 new drugs had been approved for adult cancer. And I read that and I thought, that's an amazing number. And it shows the progress that the industry is making. 77 options for, for myself, for you and I, or our relations, or whoever, if you're ever diagnosed with cancer, that you have these new options on the table. However, for childhood cancer, it is a different story. And over the last 77 years, only three new drugs have been approved. So the industry that I work in has a huge amount of work to do. And on the same theme, we all know Stephen Hawking, famous for two things, I believe. Famous, he's a famous physicist. And I believe he's the only person alive today that has survived motor neuron disease or otherwise known as ALS. And I, I don't use the word survived likely because you can see from the photographs or any images of, of Stephen that the disease has debilitated him. He communicates by blinking into a sensor or device that's connected to a nearby computer. I don't know anybody who has ALS, but I've learned a lot about it over the, next, over the last three years, and I find it to be the most vile, hideous disease known to mankind. There are no cures, and there are no drugs. The average, the average life expectancy for someone with ALS is two to six years. And I think about those numbers every day and compare it to the cost and time it takes to develop a new drug. It takes 14 years and $2.8 billion to develop new drugs. And I think about that time and cost every day and compare it to, to those people who have life-limiting conditions like Stephen with no cures and think how can technology have drive down that time and cost of drug development. So. Very briefly, a little bit of background on our life cycle. Um, the life cycle is based on what is known in the industry as good automated manufacturing practice. It's got the acronym GAMP. And really what GAMP is for us is a set of guidelines for suppliers like myself and users of automated systems in the pharmaceutical industry. We define our life cycle in policies and procedures and templates and this makes up what is known as the quality management system, and it describes our processes and controls for delivery. There's a separate quality and validation team outside of the IT delivery group who will both advise on the regulations and police the delivery to ensure compliance to both process and to regulations. And most importantly, it is that those groups that make a determination inside AMAC the, the quality and validation groups to make that determination whether a, a software solution is what we call in our industry validated 
or to put it simpler, fit for purpose. One of the very first things I learned in ANMAC many, many years ago was if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And I suppose looking back, I think it was my first day in ANMAC, I was learned that through induction and so on. And I suppose looking back, that's the evidence that we need to provide to an auditor to show them that we have the appropriate controls in place and that we're following them. And being agile for me, and we've all different, I suppose, thoughts about what agile means. And it, one of the things that it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean no documentation. And it states very clearly in the agile manifesto that it favors working software over comprehensive documentation, but nowhere does it state no documentation. So you can see from the slide deck, I have my specifications. I've got my user requirement specification and my functional specification. And then the scenario that I'm going to talk about in the example of the product delivery that I'm going to talk about, we store these specifications inside Quality Center, which I believe is now called Application Lifecycle Manager. And we use fields inside Quality Center to change the status of a requirement or specification, such as reviewed and approved. And we link the user requirement to what? To the lower level how in the functional specification, all inside Quality Center. We have to link that for traceability. And we do all of that inside Quality Center. However, at the point of release, we do export a report out of Quality Center and we wet sign those specifications. And I suppose when I was preparing this, this is all one step at a time. This is about continuous improvement. So hopefully soon I can work towards and we can work towards an ANMAC leaving those specifications in the system. At the end of my supply chain, there's a patient who will receive a drug. So whatever we do, there's a risk and possible risk to the patient. And the entire life cycle is based on risk. Risk to the patient, risk to quality, and risk to data integrity. And we work with those quality and validation groups to carry out what are known as risk assessments on the requirements. Again, this is done outside the system but it can be done inside Quality Center, because Quality Center does allow you to carry out risk assessments on your requirements. Again, as we continuously improve our process, hopefully all of this can and should remain within the system. So we have a coding and configuration phase um, through our life cycle, and the developers develop those specifications, and they carry out developer testing, which is manual, however, we're moving towards Selenium. Um, and some UFT, and we also carry out peer inspection at that phase of the life cycle as well. And that, you know, that life cycle is actually vital to build quality in earlier there. And as you, if you want to go faster, here's a, a particular part of the life cycle where you really need to focus on and improve. We have a test function, and the test function, its job is really to test the quality of the software. We do some automation here as well. A lot of it is manual, but we are doing more and more automation with unified functional testing. All of the testing artifacts are in the system or in Quality Center and linked back to the requirements for traceability again. However, we do have a report at the end, just a simple report that we produce to, to show the quality of the software. And we also have a release process that describes how to install the software. And for me, regardless if your processes are ad hoc, waterfall, Agile, Lane, or whatever you want to call these activities, or those, your, your life cycle. All those activities still need to happen in a regulated environment. And for me, it's how they happen and when they happen that makes you more agile. We're a heavily regulated industry. We're regulated by the FDA. We're regulated by the MHRA. They routinely audit us. And sometimes they do planned audits, and sometimes they do unplanned visits. And in fact, Monday of this week, I believe we had a, an, unplan an unplanned um, welcome visit from the, uh, from the FDA. We have regular customer audits, we have financial audits, and we have internal audits. And I would say there's not a day goes past that there isn't an audit of some shape or form going on in the organization. The IT delivery group has to be always ready and continuously compliant. So I'll move on to the story that we want to tell. So 
It's about the delivery of a new product that's very recently gone live, and as you go through this, you'll see how recently it's gone to market. A lot of the new drugs, just a little bit of background to it, a lot of the new drugs coming out now are known as biologics. And these biologic type drugs are given, I suppose, our industry, the, the life sciences industry and mankind in general, new opportunities for cures for diseases we never thought possible. However, these new, di these new types of drugs, these new biologics are sensitive to the environment that they're in, sensitive to temperature, light, and so on. And the regulators, the FDAs and the MHRAs are putting pressure on companies like Almac to ensure that when a product has been received and administered to the patient that is fit for purpose. And that really means that the storage condition that the, that the product has been in from the point of manufacture right through to patient consumption has been monitored and reported against and adjudicated on to make sure it is fit for purpose. So way back in probably late 2014, early 2015, we identified a concept or an opportunity that would involve placing sensors with the product and we'd receive data in real time and monitoring and adjudicating on that data on the product. For several months, we discussed the possibility with other external Internet of Things vendors who had done similar work in other industries. We discussed the possibility of them delivering the product for us. However, there was a realization that was probably either one of two things. Either one, they didn't really understand what we needed, or probably more importantly, number two, we were still really at the concept phase of what we were looking for. So in May 2015, our senior executives had a conversation with me, and I head of IT systems delivery, and they asked me two questions. Question one, can we build it internally? And of course the answer is going to be yes, we have a team of developers and developers can build whatever you want them to build. The next question they ask me is a question that every developer gets really nervous about when they ask, when it's asked of them. And that is, when can I have it? And I really think in a developer's mind at that particular point in time is, well, if I give you that information, what are you going to do with it? And to be honest, when I think about it back then, it still is only a concept phase. And as I tell this story, you'll see lots of opportunities for improvement, and, and I'm telling it warts and all, and, and as I get to the end, you will see a lot of work we're going to make to, to, to apply more and more improvements to, to what we're doing. So at that particular point in time, I sent my senior architect, who is based here in Ireland, and I sent them over to North Carolina, where the development manager was and the product owner and the developers. And what they did at that point in time is they went into a room for six weeks to have flesh out and understand the requirements, and even to do some high-level design of what that solution would be. I wasn't there, but I can imagine the room was full of mocked-up screens and lots of whiteboards and lots of drawings and so on in the room. And then at the end of a six-week exercise, they had a draft set of requirements, and I received a phone call late in the UK late one night, and it was the architect, senior architect, and the development manager on the ground and they asked me a question, and the question was, how do, how do they go about estimating this? And they provided me with two options, and the architect suggested we do high-level planning based on a screen, and we give an estimate for each screen. The development manager said, mm, you're going to hold me accountable for this. I want a more detailed plan. And I thought about it for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I went for the development manager approach because the development manager's team was responsible for the delivery of the solution. And for the next two weeks, the development manager and the team went into a room and they broke those requirements and the design elements into smaller tasks, several hundred tasks, even into functions and store procedure lab. And they put all of this into a big Gantt chart and they put small estimates beside them of days and hours long, really finite, fine detailed estimation and tasks. So they put all this into a big project plan, a big Gantt chart. And I suppose when I think about it, and, and I'm going to refer to this diagram here because when I present it back to the estimates, I look at the cone of uncertainty and I, and I thought, that was my misunderstanding when I think about the cone of uncertainty, that 
we were high up, and I'm going to try and use the pointer here. So we were high up the cone of uncertainty. And I pointed when I presented back the plan to the senior executives that these guys really do know what they're looking for at this point. They spent six weeks in the room thrashing this out. The project plan was described as a 13-month development and test effort. And that would take us through to the end of October 2016. And the business wanted a two-month UAT cycle at the end. I think we're calling this kind of agile, if you like. So they wanted that two-month UAT cycle. And that took us to the end of 2016. And this worked out really well for, for the executives because they could launch the product at a pharmaceutical supply chain conference in London at the end of January 2017. So at that time we got the go ahead, we, we mobilized the team and we started development in late September 2015. Now the business wanted to ensure close collaboration with the IT groups, which is good because that's one of the principles, if you like, of the Agile Manifesto. And we, we used some scrum when we designed a series of sprints. Um, and at the end of Sprint 2, was at the end of November 2015, I had to catch up again with the development manager on the ground. And we're just getting a progress update. And she said to me, Brendan, my velocity is half of what we thought. And I suppose I think velocity is the, the pace at which a developer can develop and produce code. So it's half of what they thought. And in my head, that 13 month estimate all of a sudden became a 26 month estimate. And I suppose it makes sense because they were starting to develop on a technology platform that they hadn't used before and they were starting to come across problems that they didn't think they would have came across. She also said to me, that the product owner keeps changing the requirements. And I suppose that makes sense to me as well because the product owner really hadn't seen anything and they're starting out to see screens and start to feel this and start to understand a little bit more about really what they want. So the feedback coming back then was starting to change some of the requirements. So at the end of November 2015, we really needed to get control and predictability back and several senior managers met and trying to come up with some plans. Now at that point in time we let the development team go into the next sprint. And the timing was pretty good for me because I left I left North Carolina and I flew back to London and I went to the HP London Discover that the Discover event. Now this is last year's event, not the one recently passed. So it was the one in two thousand and fifteen. And I suppose I was a man on a mission because I really needed help and I really needed to get to talk to some people who might help me pull this product back into line. And I listened to various presentations. I think it was at that event that we came across the tool Agile Manager. But I also met a guy there called Gary Groover. And Gary, I listened to his talks about how he transformed the laser jet division at HP and how he did the same with Macy's.com. And I wrote a book on the same topic, and the book was called Leading the Transformation, which I read um, around that time in, in early December 2015. And in that book, he wrote it with a guy called Tommy Moucher, and in that book, he had a diagram that stuck out for me. And this is about long-range planning, not detailed planning, so we're talking about long-range planning. And he, and he, he presented this diagram that you can see on the screen, and he talks about the amount of time you spent planning and the investment that you spent planning and the accuracy of your plan, and you can see from that diagram, and I think that's a fairly accurate representation that you never actually get to 100% accurate in those long-term plans. So I came away from that event, and I learned a lot, and that made me kind of think about how to pull all this back together again. And at this point in time, we're coming towards mid to late December. We're thinking that the product owners now the certainty in terms of what this product owner needs in terms of the requirements and the solution should be getting better. So the product owner was sent away and said, look, go away over the Christmas break and review and revise your list of requirements and maybe even to start thinking about them in user stories. Now, we have started to think about user stories and the themes and the features and the story level, but we're missing a key part of it still and it was the so that and that's something I really want to do soon is, is to get the so that into the story level. But um, 
But our task really was to go and review and refine and, and come back with that list of requirements. And if you, if you think about it, that was probably our first backlog, backlog refinement, except it was done with the product owner on our own. So the task was to come back with that list and have that list presented back. Sorry, there was uh, another noise there. Sorry. So, so the product owner had to come back on the 4th of January with that list, those user stories, and on the 3rd of January, through her word, she sent an email, and on the email was a spreadsheet, and on the spreadsheet there were 820 user stories broken down into the features and themes. At that particular point in time, we realized that I needed a, a better tool to help us manage the delivery of the product. And we made a small investment in a tool called Agile Manager from Mueller Packard Enterprise. And very quickly we got up and running and we uploaded the, the stories into it. The stories that were in the spreadsheet, we automatically uploaded them into Agile Manager. And you can see them here on the screen um, where it has the hierarchy, if I can get the hour work, and you can see we have the... So this is all put into what's known as the product backlog and it's probably the first key word that I'll use today is that product backlog. So you can see the story, you can see the hierarchy of the theme, and you can see the feature. Everything was put in with the status of new, and we assigned everything there to a release. And because we didn't come across the concept at this point of the MVP, everything was put into release one. Agile Manager had a really cool feature, and it's got an ability to synchronize from Agile Manager back across to Quality Center or Application Lifecycle Manager. And we use that synchronization at the start to push, I suppose, these user stories back and forward between it and Quality Center, and that became the foundation of our specifications inside Quality Center. So we have our list, our backlog. Now we had to estimate how long it would take us to deliver that, and we had a conversation with the development team how they would like to go about doing it. And I referred them back to, to Gary's diagram about long-term estimation and the amount of time spent planning and long-term planning. And the team thankfully decided to use a story point approach. Now, I'm gonna be honest, it wasn't Fibonacci, but it was still a high level of effort required to complete a particular story. So the developers got in the room with the product owner, and they put they put Agile Manager up on the screen in front of them, and they discussed story by story, and as they discussed it and understood what it meant from the product owner, they agreed a story point, and you can see here on the screen, they would have put the story point directly into Agile Manager. At the bottom now, it's, it's cut off on this, but at the bottom or in the release, you would see a total number of story points needed to complete a release. And the total number of story points needed to complete the release at this particular point in time was 828. So we knew that's the overall effort or task that we had. And then we asked the development team to estimate their expected capacity or the velocity. How many story points per sprint do they think they can deliver? And I'm thinking, well, in terms of the cone of uncertainty, on a technology point of view, they're getting a better understanding of the technology, so their cone of, uncertainty, cone of uncertainty is better. So their certainty is better on this. So they had a discussion amongst themselves for a half a day, and they worked out at that point in time that they believed they could deliver nine story points per developer per sprint. Sprint for us was 20 days long. And we had four, at that time, when we were planning this, we had four teams of two developers and three QA engineers, three test engineers. So our velocity per sprint was 72 points per sprint. And if you think about the, the high level planning that we're doing here, there's no dependencies between any of these stories. And it's a simple division. So what I did was we took the total number of story points, 828, and we divided it by the number of story points we can do in a sprint, 72, and you get the total number of sprints you need to deliver the product. We needed 12 sprints to deliver the product. Still a long time, guys, by the way, but that's what it, that's what it looked like. And again, we're thinking agile, um, for want of a better word, because we still asked for two regression test sprints at the end and a 
two months UAT cycle. And that would still take us to April 2017. Now, that wasn't the objective. We're still trying to get a release to the end of 2016. And we had to deliver that message, and it wasn't a very good message to go back to the executives with. It was four months longer than what they thought. And I was prepared going into that meeting with options, and obviously when I presented it, that was the first question they asked me, is what options did we have for delivery? And we had two. We could add more resource and increase your capacity. And the development team in conversation going into that believed we could add one more team of two developers. They thought if we added it, they didn't want to add much more than that because they felt that the team might be tripping over each other in the same code modules and so on. We couldn't obviously realize that straight away because you have to recruit them and onboard them and, and so on. So we had to realize that later on in our planning so now we had five teams of two developers and five testers. And secondly, and more importantly, we discussed the concept of the minimum viable product. And really that's a development technique for, for delivering a product with sufficient features to satisfy early users and then following up continuously with frequent feature releases. And really to do this, your quality must be high because you can't go live and then spend a lot of your time on support. So we agreed in the room we would take this approach. And to be fair, in the room that day, we had the executives, we had the product owner and myself, and we put up the uh, Agile manager again. And in the room, we started to remove, we discussed the theme, the feature, and the story, and we very quickly started to remove items from the product backlog. Um, from, sorry, from the release, so if you can see if I can point here. So we just started to remove these items from the release, and that's all we had to do. And very quickly, we ended up with a nine sprint release cycle, still very long for Agile. Um, we had a one sprint regression test at the end, again, not how I'd go about on the Agile, and we ended up with the two UAT, two months UAT at the end. So that would take us right through to the end of December 2000 and 16, and that was our plan. Now what I had asked for, which I got, was another UAT cycle somewhere through the summer. Um, I would have them probably at the end of each sprint, but I was glad to get feedback in the middle of the year. So we had our plan, and if I move on, so we agreed our plan, and you can see here another example of what a, a release plan might look like inside of um, Agile Manager, where you've got your, very briefly, you've got your, so this says Temp Easy Release 1, um, and it's got um, your teams down the left-hand side here, and then it's got the expected capacity, how many story points you believe each team can deliver in each sprint, and then at the bottom here you've got the total number per sprint, and on the far right-hand side, you can't see it in the screen, you would get a total number of story points in that particular release. So that's just another view of uh, our release plan. So, the sprint, at the start of each sprint, the teams would sit down with the product owner and they would decide what stories they wanted to work on. And they would break that down into tasks. You can see this in Agile Manager here, so they so they plan their sprint and they break it down into tasks and then they would estimate those tasks into specific hours. And you can see an example on the screen. Now this isn't from, this is an example from a demo, I think this particular one here. So you can see this is print seven, I think, of a particular example here. And then you can see the stories that we decided we were gonna do in this particular sprint. And then in a Kanban type approach, you have your tasks. So you've got new, in progress, and complete. And then all the tasks needed to complete a story would go in here. So obviously they would start off in a new column and as, as somebody was working on a particular task, they would lift that task and drag it into in progress, and they would assign it to themselves, and they would update. I suppose all that you really need to do here is assign it to yourself and update two things. It's the hours worked on and hours remaining, and as you completed the task, then you would drag it over to the completed column. And as you move your tasks from left to right in Agile Manager, it updates the percentage complete on the story. And I suppose most importantly, and we some key words just jumping out. Most importantly, when all the tasks are moved from left to right in Agile Manager, 
it asks you, do you wish to mark the story as done? So when they're all completed, it asks you that question. I think it's a vital question, a key, a key, key question. Do you wish to mark this story as done? So this is our sprint burn down. So some of the dashboards you get, some really good dashboards all out of, out of the box with no configuration um, in the product. So this is the sprint burn down. And a key lesson for me is have your teams update the information in real time because if you don't update the information in real time, you end up you end up actually fighting with your teams to go into the product and, and update the information. Otherwise, this information has no value at all. So that's a key lesson for us as we went through this. So the sprint burn down is from another release that we had. It's called Web Rant, um, and this is a particular sprint that we had in September of 2016. And you can see from this particular example, so it was September 23rd, we took that screenshot from Agile Manager. And you can see here where I'm pointing the arrow, it says capacity. And this capacity is presented in R, so we now know between now and the end of the sprint, there is 129 hours available to complete the work. However, we only needed to complete 163. So that team is well on top of the work and well capable of completing the work on the sprint. However, if you probably look back here, you can see that when we started the sprint, we had a capacity of 417 hours, I think it is, there, and we really only needed 300 hours. So we probably could have taken on some more work in that particular sprint to deliver. But I'm sure this is us guys probably learning and trying to get better at some of this um, being more agile. So that's the sprint born down. More, so that was very good for the, for the delivery teams. What was really good for me was the release born down. Where, where were we in terms of, where were we in the release in terms of the completion of the story points? And you can see from this example here, um, if I can use the pointer again, um, this isn't marked, so this is a natural, a natural um, one from the release that I'm talking about. And this is, shows here the expected velocity. So that's in story points. And that says that the team from the 21st of March to the end of September could complete 610 story points. However, they needed to complete 656, I think that number is their story points to complete the remaining work. So they're going off here now. But it does give you that information. It does give you the predictability and it allows you to take corrective action. Now I believe what happened at that point in time is that the team weren't going back and updating their tasks and their story points in Agile Manager. And um, so it's trying to get that discipline probably back into the teams. So you can see that and you can see we're going off. But the, the executives, we presented these every Monday in an executive meeting and the executives really loved this slide because it did give you the confidence of where you're at in the product delivery and and your predictability is the word I'm looking for here in terms of in terms of the release. And one senior VP did quote and saying that out of all and they've been here for twenty odd years, of all the I suppose communication and presentations they've seen on any IT delivery project that what they were saying from Agile Manager, these dashboards from Agile Manager were the best they've seen and give them more confidence. And I suppose that really reduced then the stress levels coming from the executives. And you know, long range planning can be difficult in development projects. And a lot of you on Vivid and so on would probably know Jane Kim who wrote the Phoenix Project and he describes IT delivery like a manufacturing company. And I suppose I work in a manufacturing company and I can relate a lot to that. My family grew up in the construction business. My dad was a builder and all my family were builders. And I wanted to give a slightly different analogy to try and paint a very similar picture. So my dad would plan and estimate the building of a house. And I used to have years ago with spreadsheet and help him do that so I had a good understanding of it. And he would have to give a cost and an estimate to build that house when that failed or site is nothing more than a fail at this point. So you think about the site, it's nothing more than a fail, but he still has to estimate the delivery of that. And I'm thinking in my example here, I'm thinking about the kitchen. So my dad and the people who are buying the house or building the house would have a conversation really early on, brief conversation about the kitchen, and then they would estimate what we believe it would cost. And the example that I'm going to say here is $20,000 to build the kitchen. 
And then my dad would put the diggers in and they would build the house and they would have the walls up and they would start the plastering. And very close to the time that they needed to start putting the detail into the kitchen, they would have a further detailed conversation with those people. What type of wood do you want? What about the units? What about the colours? Where, what about your electrics, flooring, and so on? And to ensure the project went to plan, all of this would have had to come to the agreed estimate of $20,000 that they agreed up front. Anything over and above that, and it's a renegotiation of the plan and budget. And for me, when I think about that analogy, it's almost like your sprint planning in your backlog refinement meetings. And at the start of the project, my dad and the owners agreed up front the same objective. They needed to build a house, and here's the budget. And I think about us too, because we made our project successful, our product delivery successful, by giving the delivery teams way back in January of 2016 the same objective. The development team, the test team, and the product owner all have the same objective to deliver the minimum viable product by the end of the year. So we did. At the end of 2016, we signed off with the validation group that our product was validated, it was fit for purpose, it was good to go. The quality was high, as high as we've ever seen in any software delivered product from an internal delivery group. So we went home at Christmas and we came back at the beginning of January and we installed, so we all had a nice break and we installed it into the production environment at the beginning of January. And we did what's called cutover qualification, it's a validation term in the industry, but we did a set of tests in the production environment to make sure that everything was up and running. And on the 31st of January 2017, we exposed the system to the world and we started shipping. And yet, that was just yesterday. And we launched it at that show in London. And that too was also yesterday. And if you go on to the amicgroup.com Twitter feed, you will see all of that information. All of this from January 2016 to yesterday was done on time, on budget, with a very high quality threshold with very little known issues in the system. So very briefly, um, like any good IT delivery, we continue to learn lessons um, and identify opportunities for improvement. Um, and I suppose the first one there that we learned was the, the concept of the minimum viable product. And through, I suppose, the delivery of the product, I know that we have two features or themes that we've developed. And later on in the year, we decided we won't need them at the point of go live. We will need them later on, but we're not going to need them for, for this week or for probably for a number of months. And I think if we had had that backlog properly prioritized and getting things done, we probably would have pulled that release back by a number of months. We would have had to massively be pulling that back a number of months. We didn't define done. That was a key lesson for me, the definition of done. It all sounds very straightforward, but we didn't define done at the story or feature level. And instead, we let the developers go one to two sprints ahead of test, and we define done as developer complete. And I suppose we all know, when a de and I used to be a developer, when a developer says something's done, it really isn't done. And this had two impacts for me and for us on the delivery of the product. It reduced our predictability. The release burn down didn't really give a fully, a true reflection of where we were in the product. And later on in the year, I did break the executive hearts when I explained that. So we still had that little bit of testing to do at the end. And nothing was done until it was all done. I never really did have a shippable product or feature until the end. And going forward, I really need to define done in small batch sizes, small release sizes of, at the user story or feature level. And I want the development teams and the test teams to work together to complete the work at that level and have our products always truly shippable. And I really want to take the story or the feature right through the life cycle from development, test, UIT, and even into production. It was funny yesterday, I went over and I seen our first shipment and I seen the box all, so inside the box there was some drugs and there was a sensor and it was all sealed up and there was an advanced button. And I took a photograph of it and I sent it to the uh, some of the teams yesterday, and I said, uh, definition of done. So that was the true definition of done. Quality, whilst the quality threshold was high, um, 
I did notice throughout the year that we did fight with it a little bit. And the development team and the test teams are separated by three and a half thousand miles. The development team are in North Carolina. The test team are in Ireland here. And it is a truly global team. And it did have some difficulties. And in this example that I want to give our developers, I'd be putting our development team under pressure to complete the work. And I suppose when I look back on it, I was doing it at the detriment of quality. And I could see what was going on retrospectively. Late, 5 o'clock in the evening, US time, the developer would complete their work and they would do their developer testing. They would check in their work. And they would send an email to the test team in the UK informing them that feature or defect or whatever it was was ready for testing. And the test team would come in the next morning and they would do a build, do a deployment. And sometimes the code that was checked in might have broke the application. And that resulted in the test team having no good build to test. And sometimes the, develop or the test team had to wait until the US guys come in. So you can see a, a three or four hours of waste that happened occasionally through the product delivery. So going forward, I really want to push for automation of the build, automation of the deployments. So we're looking at Jenkins um, to do some of that. And we're also looking to automate the testing. We've made a lot of good progress on UFT to automate that testing cycle. And before the team go home in the US, they really want to run all of that very quickly and get a positive result. And if you don't get that positive result, I want the team to either fix it or roll it back so that the test team have a good build the next day. That's called, excuse me, that's called continuous integration, and I really want to start implementing that as part of the life cycle. I also want to get away from, I suppose, the concepts around project delivery and think more about product delivery and having a product team with a development team, the test team, the product owner, the scrum master, all of those guys can work daily through a product backlog and continuously deliver the highest value items to the business. So finally, if you remember Daniel in the, la in the I think it was the second slide today, when Daniel passed away in 1999 after nine months of intense chemotherapy and he was aged three years and 36 days. And the message is clear, it takes too long and it's far too costly to produce a drug. And me as a technologist within life sciences strongly feel that we need to utilize technology better to help drive down that cost and time of drug development and delivery. And I suppose to do that, those responsible for the delivery of technology within life sciences need to become more efficient in how we deliver solutions. We need to go faster whilst remaining both compliant and keeping the quality to a very high standard. So my plan going forward is to measure how fast I'm going. I want to use lead time and second time metric to be able to do that. Hopefully that will help me identify some bottlenecks and waste in my process and remove them. I really need to reduce the batch size or release sizes and get early value to the business. To, and that early value to the business then really does allow you to become more agile. To help me do that, I want to automate my entire life cycle. That's from, I suppose, from requirements right through to release. And I believe doing that will help with my capabilities. I know when I discuss this with my team sometimes about, you know, smaller batch size, they worry about capabilities, and that's why I'm looking more and more at automation to help me with my capabilities. And maybe that might get me closer to something like continuous delivery or continuous employment. They read a good book last year through 2016 called Continuous Delivery from Jez Humble and Dave Farley. And in that book, they said, just because it was written down doesn't mean it happened. However, if we do automate the entire life cycle, we do know that the actual event has happened and that will allow us to become more compliant. Now, hopefully, if the guys in Vivid let me, I'll come back in a year or so and update everyone on our progress. And hopefully that progress will be helping ANMAC achieve its mission statement, which is the advancement in human health. So thank you guys for listening today. And I think um, I'll hand it back maybe to the host and we can have some questions. Thank you very much, Brendan. That's been a very, very interesting presentation.
with lots of insights. So I really appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have now quite some time available for a few questions. We have already some in the queue that you have inserted. Um, please take the opportunity, if you have additional questions, uh, to provide them into the list. And um, I would also like to note that if you have more technical questions, we also will be able to uh, to handle them. They will uh, be answered by HPE product experts, and you will receive the answers together um, with the slide presentation and the slide set. So we have a few questions already. So let me start with one. It is, um, Brandon, would you ever be asked to demonstrate or, or present Agile Manager or also Quality Center in a regulatory audit? Okay, so it's an, inter an interesting question because I think sometimes we have to do validate or validate or two sometimes. And right back when we started to use Agile Manager at the beginning of January, the quality teams within Amac started to raise an eyebrow and they said, well, look, you might have to validate or qualify that tool to make sure that that tool is fit for purpose. However, for me, I always pitched and presented Agile Manager as a, man as a project management tool to help us with our management of our release. Now, if we're going to use the synchronization back and forward to Quality Center, then it might be a different story. So in terms of what we present in audits, we present Quality Center definitely in audits. And we use, we use Quality Center primarily as a test management tool. So I believe we validated Quality Center and, and I've seen customer audits where we have to pull up and test results and so on and, and demonstrate that. Now, this, is, this release has just gone live. It's our first product in Agile Manager. I don't really foresee me having to demonstrate Agile Manager in an audit because how I'm presenting it as a project management tool as opposed to my artifacts and everything else are elsewhere. So my artifacts and the specifications, for example, are inside Quality Center. So QCS, Agile Manager, not, not for now, I don't believe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, obviously, regulatory issues uh, are uh, something that are very interesting to the audience. Another question is, uh, when have you wet signed the URSFS at the beginning of each sprint? No, a, a good question, actually. We, we do it at the release. Sorry if I didn't explain that well through the, uh, through the presentation. We do it at the point of release. In the examples that I'm given, we do that at the point of release. So they kind of, they've remained open which is a problem for me. I would like to close them out probably early in each sprint, but at this time I'm closing them out at the end. And that, that actually is introducing some rework for me, so I would say that I would really like to close them out early in each sprint so that when you get to the end of each sprint, all my documents are approved and I do have something truly shippable. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is referring to the um, um, use of Agile Manager. Um, do you or can you use Agile Manager to track defects? So you can. I think I think we started to use it. So, you, so when I talked about the synchronization, so the defects for us in Almac starts in Quality Center. So the, the test team would raise the defect. That defect is obviously linked to a test. And that defect can get synced across to Agile Manager and be part of the backlog and get prioritized with the features and so on in the backlog. Now, I, I've seen some defects in there, but I don't think we've properly used that functionality yet. And if anybody from HP wants to add to that, but so the functionality exists and I plan to use it, but we haven't started to use it yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think uh, we're moving uh, towards the end of the presentation. So. Um, I think we have time for one question still. So, um, yeah, the last question would be, how long did you did it take your team to ramp up on using the Agile Manager tool? So what is the setup um, activity? Yeah, so, so Agile Manager is a cloud-based tool. So when we purchased the licenses, it was available instantly. And we did discuss having some training. 
we use the videos that come with Agile Manager and there's a video on release planning, there's a video on sprint planning and there's a video on the dashboards. And that got us up and running quite quickly. And we didn't avail of any other training from HPE at that time. And I suppose we got what we needed very quickly, but I'm quite sure there's a lot of things that we don't know about the product that we haven't availed from. And maybe we, we might look back and maybe get some additional training to make sure we've, we've got best value and best use from the product. But for us, we were up and running within a few days. Um, really easy to use product. And the, the videos that are like five or 10 minutes long each or something like that really do um, help you get up and running. And I think there's a little play box area or something that's called in there too, so you can have your own mock product and play about with doing things in there before you actually go into your real product. Okay, excellent. So yeah, thank you again very, very much, Brandon. Um, yeah, before we uh, conclude the presentation, a few slides with first some uh, hints and announcements of other webinars in our today's and tomorrow's series. Uh, today there will, no, tomorrow there will be uh, two IT operations management uh, uh, webinars on cloud topics. And then also on the um, application delivery management topic, uh, there will be two additional. And uh, also uh, the, uh, obviously a slide switching. And an important date, very interesting, I think, for people in, in Europe at least, uh, will be the next EMEA Software Customer Forum, which will take place, I think, in Dublin, it doesn't show it shown here, in May. So save the dates. And yeah, with that, thank you again very much. Also, f thank you to the audience for joining us today. And um, uh, please use some time uh, to complete the short survey. That is, um, uh, associated with today's webinar um, and give us your feedback. Um, another reminder, the webinar recording and the slide deck along with the answered questions will be posted to the Vivid website in the next few days and you will receive an email with those links. So thank you again everybody very much and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.